After the War of American Independence, England had put a tariff on American goods that made the South suffer, and ships would more often sail to and from England than between the American North and the American South, and a lack of connecting railroads had kept the North and the South divided. During the War of American Independence, 40% of the population of the South had come from Africa, and slave traders had taken rum to Africa, where Africans would sell their best friends for a bottle and New York and Pennsylvania weren't as dependent on the rum trade because the North had apple trees and could make applejack while the South remained rum drinkers. Jamestown, in 1607, had been the first European settlement in America, and two-thirds of them had died from not being able to do the necessary work for survival until Captain Smith started pointing his pistol at them to make them more industrious. By 1609, some of the people in Jamestown preferred stealing from the Indians, who couldn't figure out why Europeans were so cruel. And Jamestown would have used the Indians as slaves, but they kept dying of European diseases. The people in Jamestown received their first African slaves in 1619, supposedly as indentured servants, and these were sent to work in the tobacco fields. The Africans were delighted to be away from Africa and made the mistake of doing too good a job, and so the Jamestown landowners decided to keep them after their seven years of indentured servitude were up. People from Holland and Poland and France and Russia and Armenia came over to join J Jamestown, and the settlers fought it out with the Indians in 1622, and most of the Europeans were killed. But the Indians didn't kill any of the Africans, and the Europeans hated the Africans for this and began to treat them as the enemy. The Europeans declared war on the Indians, and before anyone knew it, only a few Algonquins were left alive, and in 1660, slavery became law in Virginia. The spinning jenny and the steam engine were invented in England in 1764, and for the next 100 years, Britain was ahead of everyone else, and the British bought the South's cotton to run through its mills, exporting the finished fabric to the entire world in their many ships that had begun flying the Union Jack in 1801, boasting the Cross of St. George, superimposed on Ireland's Cross of St. Patrick, switched up with Scotland's Cross of St. Andrew. In order to grow enough cotton to keep up with the cost of import importing slaves, Southern plantations had to be utterly enormous, and living in isolated splendor with their unpaid servants, the Southern lifestyle tended towards assumptions of superior rank and breeding, so plantation owners identified more with European nobility than with their more common and pedestrian northern neighbors. Since most of the people who'd settled in Georgia were the wretchedly poor outcasts of England, their hatred of poverty had grown into thinking that it was nobler to own slaves than to be poor. With no incentive to labor, slaves worked as little as possible, so Southerners thought Africans were lazy, although the slaves' own gardens thrived, kept carefully under the radar, lest the masters become suspicious. Living so far away from their neighbors, Southerners on their huge estates were confined mostly to the company of their Africans, and the arrival of any visitors would explode into a massive party, and behind their dedication to Southern hospitality, the plantation owners kept a large number of mixed-race offspring. Plantation owners practiced the persistent tradition of battling for honor, which they considered not only to be the height of virtue, but the only proper and legitimate way of life. And with Africans doing all their work, the southern plantation owners had more than enough time to come up to Washington, D.C. to stir up trouble with the government. Because slavery allowed plantation owners the luxury of running for public office. The presidency was almost continuously in Southern hands from 1789 to 1837.
Slavery had been outlawed in Vermont in 1777, and when slaves revolted in Haiti in 1791, it had been seen primarily as a French problem because the French had tried to turn their Africans into French citizens, and the Haitians had taken the revolutionary ideas of France to heart. The British would have helped quell the revolt in Haiti, but they were too busy worrying about Napoleon, and when the French withdrew from Haiti, the spirit of revolution spread to infect all enslaved Africans and caused 150 revolts on slave ships. By 1801, there were five million people in America, and one million of them had come from Africa, and all free Americans of African descent had to leave Virginia after 1806, and importing slaves became illegal in Virginia in 1807, but it continued anyway. While slaves were being bought and sold, the Navy was in the practice of flogging their sailors, and it amused the Indians that Lewis and Clark would flog members of their own company. Nat Turner started a slave revolt in August of 1831 by killing his master and marching across the country, making friends and killing people, and both sides lost 100 people until Nat Turner's revolt ended in October, when Nat Turner suffered death by hanging. Hundreds of slave revolts followed, but plantations were too far away from each other for any serious rebellion to spread, and slavery would have ended when the plantations went out of business, but Eli Whitney's invention of the cotton gin in 1793 had kept the South in business. Until the cotton gin, very few people could afford to buy clothes made out of cotton, and instead they wore flax or hemp, but now they could wear cotton, and Whitney also invented the first mass-produced gun rather than their having to be made by hand, one at a time. To emphasize the unpleasant foreign nature of slavery, Uncle Tom's Cabin was written in 1852 by someone who thought the African slaves should be returned to Africa, and Uncle Tom's Cabin had first been published in a magazine with the title Life Among the Lowly, and then the novel was made into a play that toured across the country. Uncle Tom's Cabin described African slaves as being unable to speak the American language or simply struggling along using some childlike rendition, and Southerners believed that giving freedom to Africans would harm them because the Africans were not mentally capable of meeting the responsibilities required of a free people. Plantation owners considered it their duty to beat some of their slaves and to shoot others in order to keep them safely in line for their own good, and Southerners who treated slaves with violence were prone to treat political opponents the same way. Dueling had been the Southerners' argument of choice, so it would be just one small step farther to challenge the North to war. The political fight had intensified over fugitive slave laws, and in exchange for California becoming a free state in 1850, Southerners had been allowed to press their fugitive slave laws, but they'd done so to the extreme. If anyone failed to help arrest a fugitive slave, they were subject to arrest themselves, and so the North was being made to suffer from the institution of slavery in the South. Fugitive slave laws were helped by the fact that it was impossible for the Africans to blend in, and in 1856, a senator from the South broke his gutta percha cane over the head of a senator from the North on the floor of Congress. Senate brawling on the whole has been less frequent than the House variety, and more rigorously condemned after the fact. In 1850, while Senator Henry Foote of Mississippi was speaking on the floor, Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri made menacing gestures and advanced towards Foote's desk. Foote drew his pistol and ostentatiously cocked it, but cooler heads intervened. An investigating committee recommended censure of both men, but the Senate took no action. Both Your Houses, The Truth About Congress by Warren Weaver, Jr., New York Prager Publishers, 1972, page 48.
The war wasn't so much about the price of cotton or the amount of wages being paid in northern factories, and it wasn't even about the independent treasury keeping America's money away from private banks. The issue was actually about land, and Abraham Lincoln wanted America to be big enough to be able to stand on its own feet and say no to Europe. Without the South, America was in danger of falling prey to Britain's desire to reclaim its old colony of New England, and the Southerners thought that becoming a colony again was not such a bad idea. Many Southern plantation owners were of noble descent, having fled from Napoleon's experiment in democracy, and their offspring thought the notion of being ruled by princes was rather romantic, while the Northern immigrants, who'd come from England and Germany and Italy, were willing to shoot anyone, inviting royals over to take a land survey. Britain had extensive experience with foreign lands and slavery, so it had not been difficult for the British to side with the slave owners, while in England the working classes sided with the North and the nobility with the South, and Lincoln had been a land survey surveyor and knew how many farms fit within a mile and how many miles it took to build a sustainable tax base. Lincoln knew that when a country managed to acquire a big enough piece of land, it no longer need be afraid of its neighbors, and his example was Russia, who had never lost a war because it was so overwhelmingly large. Lincoln knew enough to follow that example, and George Washington had also been a property surveyor, and George Washington had no children of his own to whom he could pass his land holdings, so Washington had become the father of the whole country. The South wanted more land, and the South needed more land because cotton required plenty of farmland, but since slaves had no vote, the North held the majority in electing Lincoln. The vice president in 1860 was a southerner, and people wanted to believe that Johnson had northern sympathies, but Johnson had been put on the ticket with Lincoln specifically to gain southern votes, and Andrew Johnson would become president over Lincoln's dead body. Johnson had been making changes to Lincoln's policies to satisfy Southerners, and Johnson even owned a dozen slaves himself, while Lincoln wanted to send them all to Panama, and Booth's calling card had been left at Johnson's residence the day before the killing of Abraham Lincoln. Johnson had been inviting people from the South over for afternoon juleps and he'd been openly agreeing with them that Americans of African descent had no business being given the vote. And since the days when there were no roads or running water in Washington, D.C., just a few marble buildings and a slave market, abolitionists had been agitating for slaves to be free to go to church on Sunday and have that as a day of rest, but they didn't want them to be free citizens, just free to become Christians. In 1850, the slave trade had been quit in Washington, D.C., but not slavery itself, and an uppity African was one who had the audacity to question God. Slave owners believed that God approved of slavery since Jesus wanted to set prisoners free, but not any slaves, and when Liberia had been created in Africa in 1821 as a country for freed slaves, it had been spearheaded by a church organization. The American Colonization Society was not interested in freeing slaves, but in deporting those who had been freed, so they couldn't cause trouble for the institution of slavery. And the capital of Liberia was named Monrovia after the Monroe Doctrine, and Liberia had finally been recognized as its own country in 1862. Vice President Johnson had been too poor to go to school, and his wife had taught him to read and write, so Johnson didn't hate slavery so much as he despised the big plantation owners with an abiding and a profound dislike, because Johnson did not fit in with the educated people in Washington, and he knew that he was just being used to prop up Abraham Lincoln's ticket. Johnson liked to travel making speeches, and his main argument was that slaves were private property, and thus the government had no business interfering in the business of keeping slaves, and he enjoyed engaging in animated discussions with the crowds and would get into fistfights with the hecklers 
Johnson knew that slavery had to end because it was trying to overthrow the government, and he freed his own familial slaves in 1862 and saw to it that 20,000 soldiers of African descent were recruited into the Union Army. Swarthy, strong-visaged, combative, he made a drunken spectacle of himself at the inauguration, but he was not, as most historians are quick to insist, drunk by mistake. The speech he made came from a mind which was accustomed to inebriated diatribes and in full flavor with the whiskey, quote, a rambling, egotistical speech, close quote, which made people call him an insolent, drunken brute. A History of Presidential Elections, page 203. America had imposed the first protective tariff against English trade goods in 1816, which helped the North but not the South, so the war between the states was in some measure about getting rid of cheap labor so the North would be able to compete in the market but the South was also not paying their fair share of taxes, and as England fought tariffs and tax laws, the southern states found themselves, in essence, trading with the enemy. To make matters worse, each American state used a different currency, and the government needed all states to use one kind of money, and that would begin with the Lincoln Greenback. In exchange for industrial goods, the North did not want to accept the South's Confederate dollars, whose value was determined by bankers in London, not to mention that the Confederate flag closely resembled the British Union Jack. And while the South had little to trade but cotton, Northern merchants were creating a wide variety of products that were not just sustaining the American homeland, but had made them self-sufficient. After the War of 1812, New England had built their own cloth-making machines because they had plenty of substantial rivers to power water wheels while the South was simply flat and mostly agricultural. After a while, the New Englanders began to use the power of steam, but the South didn't build these kind of factories because they didn't have to, since Africans were doing all that sort of work. By 1860, there were four million Africans in the South, and less than one in 1,000 were living free. And 1860 was also the biggest year for importing Africans. Americans were required to start paying income tax in 1861, which angered the South because it taxed at 3% only those with an income over $800, and the tax rate rate increased to 10% on incomes over $10,000, so the largest portion of taxes would come from plantation owners, not from the northern factory workers. To protect the Confederate dollar, the southern states seceded and then quit selling cotton to England, hoping to pressure the British military into coming over to help the South fight against the North. Unfortunately, England had plenty of cotton stored in warehouses, so they just rode out the war between the states, although Britain would pay the victorious North upwards of $15 million in damages caused by Confederate warships the South had bought from England. Robert C. Winthrop said that in 1856, <clears throat> The South is, upon the whole, the very poorest, meanest, least productive, and most miserable part of creation, and therefore ought to be continually teased and taunted and reviled by everybody who feels himself better off. A History of Presidential Elections, page 165. In 1858, the British Crown had finally been able to take over the East India Company's reign after they'd been weakened by the Indian mutiny, and instead of getting cotton from the American South, England geared up to get cotton from Egypt and from India now that the Queen was the sovereign of India, but their investments in growing cotton would suffer from Islamic uprisings in both India and Egypt. In 1857, the South was hit by a panic in the New York commodity exchange market. For a time, money exchange with England virtually ceased, and so did the effective demand for cotton in England. A cotton crop that could have sold for 100 million went for 65 million. Violence in America, Historical and Comparative per Perspectives, edited by Hugh Davis Graham and Ted Robert Gurr, 
Beverly Hills Sage Production Publications Incorporated, 1979, page 423. The North was even exporting food, grains, and livestock to the agricultural South, and free farmers were saying politically that they did not want to compete, economically or socially, with plantationers whose field hands worked without pay. But the South itself was enjoying, early in the 1850s, unprecedented prosperity. There was an almost insatiable world demand for cotton, of which the South had close to a world monopoly in production. Along with this, and an improvement in profit from tobacco and sugar cane production, came an increase in the price of prime field hands, the most commonly valuable category of slaves, their price doubled during the 1850-1860 to 1860 decade, reaching as high as $1,500 per head, and the demand was enormous. It was not easy for Southerners to concede the rightness or the efficiency of an economy based on free labor. Violence in America, page 422. A particular weakness was the plantationers' custom of buying on credit advanced before the sale of their crops. Even before the 1775 War of Independence, it was common for southern planters to be thus in long-range debt to English merchants. After 1783 there was one change. The creditors were now northern merchants, mainly in New York. The South quite simply remained money-poor up to 1871 and beyond Ibid. When the panic hit the stock exchange in 1857, the New York Life Insurance Company failed, creditors called in their loans, business came to a standstill, and land speculators out west became scarce, hiding from their clients. The South had been supporting the push west because they wanted to protect and extend slavery, not only because it was the only way of life they'd ever known, but because they were so heavily invested in it. The Southerners had not been able to support the pioneers with any real money or manpower, just lofty talk, and when Fremont conquered California before the South could, the Southern-dominated Congress would make sure that there was hell to pay. When California came in as a free state in September of 1850, that upset the balance between slave and free, and Jefferson Davis became America's Secretary of War in 1852, at a time when Congress was almost as wild as the West. Senators were packing pistols into the chamber and engaging in an interesting amount of gunplay, and when Senator Benton's house burned down in 1855, destroying all the papers and letters from Fremont's expeditions, both the House and the Senate adjourned out of sympathy for Senator Benton. Swept along by Benton's influence, Fremont ran for president in 1856, and while his opposition said that if Fremont were president, there would be a civil war, the truth was that he might have prevented it. The campaigning was very hostile, and Fremont was called a drunk and a Catholic because he'd been married by a priest after eloping with Jesse. And a newspaper called him the bastard son of a French fiddler, the ingrate citizen, the heartless traitor to the state of South Carolina. John Charles Fremont, Character as Destiny, by Andrew Rowley, University of Oklahoma Press, 1991, page 289, from the St. Louis Leader, October 5, 1856. Secret political societies were thriving, such as the Know-somethings and the German Sagniks, who were vigilantes dressing like the clergy in Spain that had championed the Inquisition, and in 1856, Abraham Lincoln made 50 speeches in support of Fremont's bid for president. When the ballots were counted, Buchanan got 1.8 million votes, and Fremont got 1.3 million votes, and Fillmore, with his third party, the Know Nothings, won almost 900,000 that had split the vote. But the main reason Fremont was not elected was because he was French. <laughs>